Hey, this is Dave Pryor. Welcome to Leading Agile Sonos. This week we're doing another video. Jessica Wolf has taken time out of her morning. Jessica, thank you for being here. Pleasure being here. And we both loaded up on the caffeine because it's early in the day. Um, there's her coffee. And we're going to do some coaching Absolutely. questions. Before we get into that, Jessica has a very strange title here at Leading Agile, and we're super into titles. So um, can you explain <laughs> what your role is and, and talk a little bit about your background, too, so folks get to know who you are? Absolutely. So uh, senior tooling uh, consultant uh, for ALM Tools here at Leading Agile. I work with Derek Keither uh, to uh, really what we do is we look at tools as if it's our product, right? So we're tool agnostic and we want to make sure that whatever tool a company actually picks, whether it be uh, post-its and a whiteboard or anything as advanced as uh, version one, we want to make sure that it's set up in the way that they need it to be set up. So that's our product. And we're almost the product owners representing the business to make sure that it's set up in that way. The other cool thing about it is that we want to set it up so this way our model can actually work within the tool because we know what we do at Leading Agile, right? So that's really the focus of it, making sure that it works for them and they understand how they can scale it as they continue to grow and transform uh, in their uh, journey. Okay, so we're not just going to throw Rally or version one or whatever at them and say, here, go do this, but we're going to show them how to use it to evolve towards a more agile state especially given that they're using base camps with the leading agile approach. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. And the cool thing about it is that, you know, it's not just tools and metrics for us. We get to actually be a product owner. We get to yeah. coach, we get to do everything. So it's kind of fun. <laughs> so you guys customize it for each individual customer then when it gets implemented? We start with one approach, right? We have our, okay. our baseline of this is what we think is best from a leading agile standpoint. Now let's do some gap analysis. Let's look at what you're doing now. And then the steps to get you to the point of where we think you should be. Sometimes it's okay. not just a, hey, let's configure it to be what you, we think it should be approached because there may right. be some baby steps to get there. So we really have to take you through that journey. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to ask you for your contact information at the end. So if people want to follow up with answers to the coaching questions we're about to take on, they can get in touch with you. These are questions that I got from students. So a few weeks ago, I wrote to everybody who's taken the class in the last two to three months. And I said, what questions do you still have? And I got two from the same person. And we're going to go over those now. So first off, throw out the first one, which is, and I'm just reading right off the iPad. Uh, what is the desired relationship interaction between the Scrum Master and the development managers with regard to developers who are participating on a Scrum team? And how does that impact performance management from an HR standpoint? In other words, if there are performance issues with a developer, where does the responsibility fall for addressing and resolving those performance issues? And I have a very specific scenario that I will introduce after we hear the wisdom that you're about to drop in this situation. I will try my best not to drop the mic too hard. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, um, this is actually um, a common scenario, especially when we start with teams that are component based, and you've got your dev manager that's running the entire team. Um, when we start to mold into an agile way, a lot of times you have people with different skill sets that are on yeah. that same team that might potentially have different managers and that's a good thing right but let's go back to the what it normally is when we start right you have your dev manager you have your scrum master right and then from there number one our scrum master that's us over here right we are responsible for scrum right we want to make sure that we are doing scrum we want to make sure that we're being the servant leader of our team Right. Dev manager isn't that. <laughs> dev okay. manager can be a servant leader, right? But that person is really there to help build that skill set of the developer or whoever else um, might actually uh, be in that place, whether it's QA, whether it's DBA. Those are just skills. I mean, the role is that you're a, a, a dev team member. There's many skills that should be on that team. And that dev manager really is the person who helps build them up. So one, from an HR standpoint, from a uh, development standpoint, that's the dev manager, right? Now, okay. Scrum Master and dev manager, right? They should interact. They should talk. If there are things that we're seeing as a Scrum Master that 
eh, you know, it doesn't seem to be gelling. There's something going on. We may want to bring in the manager to, to really help figure that out when it comes to the work that they're doing. Now, the process is the scrum manager. They're the person that says, hey, you know, we're going to do scrum. We're going to do it in this way. We're going to retrospect right. and we're going to look at these things. Uh, it's scenario by scenario based, right? So I've worked with dev managers who want to also run the process. And I've worked with scrum masters who also want to uh, be the HR person, <laughs> and the manager. Yeah. So it, it's a give and take. But I would say at the end of the day, I'd love it if everyone could just be a servant leader. So you need to talk about them interacting. It's not from the perspective of like, I'm the scrum master. I'm going to go tell on this guy. So the manager can come down on him like a hammer, but more that they're interacting almost, this is going to sound horrible when I say it out loud, but I'm going to say it anyway, like parents talking about, you know, the, the best thing for a child, um, Absolutely. but that's not, not that the person on the team is a child, but with that same level of shared caring. So even though they have different goals and objectives, the, the functional manager and the scrum master are kind of putting their heads together to find the best way to help this person rise to the challenge of scrum and get better at what they're doing. Absolutely. That's, that's the perfect world. Now to get there is sometimes a challenge really. Yeah. And I think a working agreement between the scrum master and the dev manager is absolutely necessary too, because, you know, there could be things that they don't agree on and you don't want that to manifest in front of the team either. Right. So it is kind of okay. like, you know, mom and dad, right. You don't want to argue in front of the kids. Uh, you want to do that on the side. Right. And, and have your working agreement to come to a conclusion because the outcome that you want is in the best interest of the team members, right? So okay. really focusing on that outcome and not what you personally want. <laughs> okay. Now, real life situation, well, <laughs> hypothetical situation. Let's just say I have a friend and the friend several companies ago, he worked at a place and he had a guy on a team who fancied himself quite the rock star and was perceived as a rock star within the company and also had a substance problem. And mm -hmm. was showing up late all the time, kind of disrespecting a lot of stuff, not really following it anymore, but was convinced and it convinced many people that they were so agile that no one should ask them anything because they didn't need to change anymore. They had evolved. Scrum master can't tell the person what to do. Functional manager actually believes this person is a rock star. What do you do? Oh, man, you're throwing me some fun, <laughs> hard questions here. Good for the coffee. coffee. Okay. Um, honestly, I think that this is something that's affecting the team as well. Yeah. This it almost sounds like an intervention is needed, um, and that's like let's take <laughs> work out of it. Um, if there's yeah. a substance abuse problem, I think that getting HR involved is is necessary, but not from a standpoint of you should get this person in trouble, but you should get this person help. Get some help. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think let, let's take agile out of it. Um, I think that is the right thing to do, get this person some help. So this way they're not doing those things. Um, now let's take the substance thing out of it. Out of the equation, and this, okay. Yep. <laughs> and, and now we have this person who thinks they're a rock star. Maybe they are a rock star, right? And we've worked with tons of rock stars who um, could probably own their own businesses, but work in a company, right? Yeah. And it's still kind of, we want to make sure that we're all working together as one team working towards the same outcomes and in okay. the same way. Um, so that rock star is still going to shine. They're still going to do great. And that dev manager can always count on them, right? I think that there's that working agreement that needs to happen between the scrum master and that dev manager too, to say, hey, these are, this is disrupting here, right? Yeah. Especially, and, and this is where I love to come in um, from a metric standpoint, right? So if we have a system and the system is being disrupted in a negative way and we can measure that waste, right? So if we're thinking about lean, and, um, and, and you could do that in Scrum too, like thinking about, you know, hey, how do we get through Cycle our Scrum process? So. To do? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and there are some things that aren't visible. There are some things that we're not seeing. I can't really measure that. And when we have those things roll up to the program level and then to the portfolio level and then to the executive level and those things are missing, we can't talk about them. We, okay. can't, we can't represent that rock star if they're not really fall, falling into kind of what just the minimum of we just need to see stuff, right? Yeah. Um, we need to retrospect on things because especially that rock star, right? So they're coming in, they're, they're doing their thing. People can learn from them. Maybe there's some other people who, um, you know, 
don't necessarily know that type of stuff. And that could come up in the retrospective to help cross train, you know, yeah. I think helping to get them to buy in as well is really necessary. And the scrum master, it's your job to build that relationship. It, it really is like, don't just say, Oh, they think they know it all. They hate agile. Well, find out why. Right. <laughs> Screw <laughs> like, them. Yeah. yeah. You know, get to the why and, and yeah. build that relationship. That's your job. Like you okay. have to work with them. And, you know, it's funny because for me, I always wanted to, to, to get to the why. I really want to make sure I understand what those roadblocks are and why things are happening the way they are. Because yeah. at the end of the day, too, if you think about it, you may have one person that's saying, ah, oh, this thing, blah, blah, blah. I don't like it, right? Is that behavior from the person or is it owned by the system? And is our system that's a really manifest? Good point. It's fostering. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So if you remove that person, that behavior may manifest somewhere else. So understanding the why and getting to the root of the cause is so much more important, I think, than that surface level. What's the behavior patch itself? On it. So this is really interesting because I I agree with everything you said, and it's neat to me that you have a very different approach to it because I look at that situation like you know taking the substance thing out of the equation because that is something that definitely has to be dealt with with HR. Um, the scrum master's job is not just to be a servant leader, but it's a hacker. They're a social engineer. They have to hack people. So you've got to f solve the puzzle of how do you get this person to want what you want them to want without telling them what to want. So I don't want to be like, hey, dude, you know, this is not cool. These four things that you're doing. I want them to get to a point where they're like, hey, these things that I'm doing are not cool. I want to change them or have the team help them get there. But I want to do that as stealthily as possible. So to me, that's that's one of the things that makes the job of Scrum Master so much fun is it's like, how do I create these situations that produce the result that I want? Um, so it's, it's neat to me that you came at it from a totally different side. So thank you. Especially, oh, so for the folks that, that are watching, this is our first time we've done one of these together. And we, when I do audio podcasts, people can stop and start whenever they want. But not only is this the first time we've done a podcast together, it's video and it's all just recorded live. So we can't mess up at all. So. <laughs> awesome job on the first question. You're ready for number two. We're ready for number two. <laughs> okay. I work at a fairly large company on a product that has direct eyesight from the CEO who constantly says things like, wouldn't it be cool if our app did X? With the expectation being that it doesn't matter how cool X actually is, we can expect to be implementing it right freaking now. I'm just reading the words on the page. They're not my words. How, for the love of Scrum, can I deal with this within my framework? <laughs> this is a fun one. And number one, I have to say, it's awesome that the CEO wants to be that involved, right? Not, not all the time you get that. Very start, yes. Right? So <laughs> I think number one, that is awesome, right? Yeah. I also think that the Scrum Master, Agile Coach, whoever is leading this really needs to have a... Um, I guess I'm going to sound a little religious here, a come to Jesus moment with the CEO. Of, sure. We want to make sure that we're able to uh, focus on completing the work, right? We want to focus on finishing. And in order to do that, the disruption can cause us to not finish anything. And then you're going to say, why isn't anything done? So mm -hmm. I think it's great that you, it's even that during the day you want to come around like, oh, this is cool, right? I think that we shouldn't set the expectation for the developers that they need to do that right now because it needs to be prioritized in the backlog. We need to go through the product owner. We need to evaluate it and say, yeah. okay, this may be cool, right? But at the end of the day, what value does it bring our company? How much effort is going to go into building this? Do people really want this? Have and we is done it our more important research? than something else? Should we actually right. drop this thing to chase that shiny coin? Exactly. So it might actually be beneficial to include the CEO in those meetings. So it's where they know what happens, okay. right? Like celebrity guests, CEO comes to down. This is how we do things. I want you to still go out there and see what's happening. I think it's great that you're interacting. Keep doing that. But know that it does cause a little anxiety when you say that to a, a developer because they want to please you, right? So, so can I, can let's I bring it back. For one second? Of so, course, yeah. Do you think then that I'm thinking about the CEO coming into the room for backlog refinement or whatever. Um, I always advocate for the product owner, making sure that all the stakeholders know how work is being prioritized. But I'm wondering if with what you're saying, we should try to get the C-level person to a point where 
there's, oh, I had an idea. I'm going to put it in the you know queue for the PO, and I'll go to the meeting to figure out how are we assessing it from a cost of delay perspective or whatever techniques you're using. To, if you can get the C-level person to a point where it's not just, I had an idea, everyone dance for me now, but um, I have an idea, I have a process that's going to vet my idea, and maybe they can kind of ease up off the gas a little bit, because it sounds like this guy's just running in like, oh, sparkle time, you know, and we don't want that. <laughs> right, and, you know, at the end of the day, they may not have, I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'm a CEO. This is all I have time to do is just go and tell, like spit out my ideas and I don't have time to go through these meetings. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think then now it's our job to provide them the data around what happens when that happens. Right. We need to yeah. paint the picture of what that looks like. Right. Because there is value in the CEO providing input. Right. And we don't want to stop that. I, I wouldn't want to say the whole don't come and do anything, but we want to make sure that it's in a controlled way where they can still see value at the end of the day, and not be upset because we're not delivering anything because we're working on too much. So you want some kind of metrics, some way of tracking the impact of the interrupt, maybe to like right. what it does to the flow and things like that. Right. Coachable moments, right? So sometimes as Scrum Masters, we actually need to, instead of saying halt, right, we, we want to actually say, okay, let's see what this looks like and measure it right? Because it's a coachable moment. We'll allow this piece of work to come in. We're going to add it to our work in progress here. We have we extended our work in progress limits. We blocked other items. We can actually tell the story with it. And it's just okay. one sprint that was disrupted versus an entire multiple sprints, an entire year of work, right? So sometimes right. being able to say in a controlled way, you know, let's fail fast and learn fast. Sure. Let's allow this to come through. Let's show them what it looks like and then say, hey, this is what's happening when this when we do this. We want to work on it, right? And we're going to pull it in, but there's got to be a trade-off. There's got to be some things that we discuss before we just let this happen in this way because we're not going to get everything done that we might need to get done. It's not vetted as far as, you know, what other things in the system does it connect to? Is there a way that we can bring this value um, uh in a more intelligent way to say like, right. you know, it's just, we should have a discussion about it and allow the whole team to have input because they're smart people and okay. they have great ideas. <laughs> cool. All right. So I want to check one more thing with you. So um, the other thing I was thinking, going back a few minutes, when you started to talk, you talked about the C-level person having the idea, then you talked about the team member and I'm a little worried about that person. Because mm -hmm. it's easy for me to say, like, hey, junior intern developer guy, when when the president of the company says, hey, kid, over here, you say, I'm sorry, I'm not doing that for you. I have to go do for my scrum master. That kid's going to get fired immediately. So do you think it would make sense then to get the whole team, the whole scrum team and the executive staff in a room and say, listen, when you have idea time, on you get on an airplane, you read Harvard Business Review, the light bulb goes off. You want special project time. This is what's going to happen. You're going to come up to the guy. The guy's going to say, listen, I'm sorry. We have to go talk to the product owner or the scrum master, whoever the best person is. And you're going to hand the executive and their idea off so the developer can go back to work. And we're going to find a way to teach the executive to stop interrupting the people that are producing. That's a perfect scenario, right? It's okay. easier said than done, right? Because, I, and I've been in the same scenario. Okay, <laughs> where we good. have Shooting executives holes, coming yes. in, and then you have development team knowing that, you know, hey, we have a certain process, but they also want don't to want to get fired. Please. Well, it's not just about being fired, right? They don't think they're going to get fired. They want to please the executive and be like, oh, look at the special okay. thing I did for you, right? So yeah. I, I think that it's, it's more along the lines of, I did this special thing for you and I was able to do it. And okay. it, and I, and then maybe they were still able to get their work done, but maybe they weren't, right? Because it's like, oh, yeah. I have to do this thing for the CEO, right? Um, and that makes them feel also special because they came to me, I'm the guy, right? Exactly. So it's fostering a behavior, right? So these are the behaviors that this that are now embedded in the system when we do that. Okay. So, it, like I said, it's easier said than done. I think just making sure that it's visible first, so this way we can deal with it and essentially the developer will have some anxiety imagine if uh, our our ceo mike 
comes to us and says, you know, I really want you to work on like this is I have this really cool idea for tools and metrics, and I really need you to to work on this right now, right? But I might have a whole bunch of stuff, right, yeah. that I'm working on for a client. Um, I still want to please Mike. So for me, I'm gonna have a little anxiety. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna stay up all night and do it, not get any sleep, right? <laughs> and I'm gonna do it. Um <laughs> I'm Steve, you've been there. Yes. <laughs> I'm just thinking about how I would respond to my like, yeah, okay. <laughs> right? So like it, yes. it creates a little anxiety too. Um, so I think just bringing the information to the executive to understand how it creates a system within their company, a culture within their company that is manifesting certain behaviors to happen but because – Who's going to do that? Because if I'm the developer and the executive's like, hey, kid, come over here for special rock star time, I'm not going to be like, I think we should explore the impact of your behavior on the social cultural system of the organization. Like, you're not going to do that. <laughs> Who's no, going to do that? No, the developer isn't going to do that. It's going to be the scrum master, the agile coach, even okay. the dev manager, right? It's going to be the people who are responsible for the process. I wouldn't expect the developer to immediately stand up and be like, no CEO, right? I expect them to do like, because it, it, it's awesome. Find a way them. out of the situation as best they can, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I would want them to do that, but as far as human nature and expectation, they're going to go do what the CEO says. Okay. Right. So, do you think <laughs> then that? So, you talked about coachable moments. Um, I can see as a scrum master saying to the team, like the first time around when this happens, you do what the person wants, and we'll probably fail the sprint. And we're just going to let that one happen. But then in the sprint review, we're going to explain why we felt the sprint. And we're going to make sure the executive knows the impact. And that ever, that's when we're going to have our come to whatever deity you want to subscribe to <laughs> meeting and, and get everybody sorted. So this will be a place where you might let the wheel fall off the car for a few minutes before you straighten things out. Absolutely. Because if you don't have the impact of it in front of them and you just say hey i think this is going to happen uh, right. if they don't think it's going to happen it's going to be hard to convince them <laughs> cool. so sometimes you have to like let it happen to say okay yeah. you know this is a small failure we're going to fail fast learn fast and we're going to move through this right as a scrum master it's hard to let that happen but release control you're the servant leader you have to serve the team and to serve the team sometimes you have to show what failure looks like in a small way that doesn't hurt us so can I ask you one more question? And this is this isn't a question from a student. I'm actually just asking this question. Yeah. Um, so we've both been doing this stuff a long time. And I'm thinking back to earlier in my career. In that situation, if I'm the scrum master and I gotta back the executive down or explain to them why what they did is the source of why we're in so much pain. Like, this is why you're the problem. Um that's scary and hard and I am nervous about that. Like still I get like, yeah. Um, I mean, I think unfortunately I've reached a point where like, that's exciting to see what's going to happen in that moment now. So I'm like, yeah, well give it a shot. But how do you, or how have you in the past kind of coached yourself into rising to that moment in a polite, respectful, but stern way? <laughs> yeah. So the book Crucial Conversations was okay. <laughs> excellent in helping me get there. Right. Um, so I've had a lot of missteps. I think we all have. Um, yeah. But to the point of where I've success of, successfully been able to do it is n you can't surprise them. You can't be like at the end of the sprint, like, well, I knew this was going to happen. Right. Let them know, hey, we're going <laughs> to bring this finger. in. Right. We're going to yeah. bring this in. Um, it might impact the team. We're going to do it. Then we're going to um, talk about it after. Uh, but let them give them a heads up. Like we're going to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually at the time when you know, the work's being pulled in, reach out like, Hey, thank you for your suggestion. This isn't <laughs> our normal process, right? Our normal process is to do X, Y, Z. However, um, this seems really important to you. So we're going to bring it in. But we're going to show you kind of how it affects our process when that happens. Okay, cool. I think, All right. This, like, this was great. Yeah. <laughs> So the, but yeah, it is scary, that, right? right? It takes a long time to, um, I guess, mess that up enough that you're not so scared of it anymore, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sure anybody watching who has worked with me, I uh, would say years ago, have probably seen some of the things of me misstepping and then working through it and getting better. Uh, it's a journey. You know, yeah. Agile is a journey. Um, you know, Agile isn't an outcome either, right? Agile is a way that we get to our outcomes and the one thing i love about leading agile is that we're outcomes based right our ceo is outcomes based 
what we're looking for in conflict resolution is let's have a shared outcome, right? What, what are we all trying to get to? Because if we can really focus on that outcome and take personal out of it, like this is my process, don't affect my process. That's not about that. We want to get to this outcome and what's the best way to get there. Yeah. I, and I think just going back to the example of Mike, like if, if Mike came and was like, uh, I had an idea I need you to do it right now. Um, I, it's hard for me to say how I'd react, but I hope that I would react with like, look, I'm happy to do that. But if I do that, this is what does not happen. And I want you to make a decision about which thing is like, this is the impact that you talked about outcomes so outcomes and impact. This is what happens if I do that thing. And then, maybe that can help the person get sort of a bigger picture understanding of, oh, well, no, maybe my thing's not that big, or maybe it really is. You're giving mm -hmm. them choices. So where it might seem disrespectful, I think the important thing to remember is if you are the bringer of that push, you're actually offering them information that helps them make a smarter choice that is more in line with their goals, whatever they pick. Absolutely. And I think that, uh, and that's one thing I didn't bring up, giving them the option even, you know, I think that's a great yeah. idea to say, hey, you know what, we could do this. But if we do this, our product owner says that this is the least priority, this isn't going to get done. Um, and we may not get this one done too. What's your trade off? Yeah, cool. All right. Th this was awesome. You did great. So thank you for doing this. <laughs> um, if people want to get in touch with you with follow up questions, what's the best way to reach you? Um, my lead agile email is probably the best way. It's the one that I look at all the time. Okay. Uh, Jessica dot wolf wolf with an e at okay. leading agile .com. Um, okay. but if uh, you share my um, information I think my bio has my LinkedIn my Twitter uh, okay. so you can get in contact with me in those ways too cool all right thank you very much for doing this uh, and I'll talk to you soon awesome thanks Dave